So welcome to the fourth Rebel Wisdom podcast. This is going to be about the intellectual dark web. Uh, I'm kind of assuming most of the people watching this, most of our audience will know what the intellectual dark web is, but I think it's worth doing a short introduction. It's sort of emerged from the sort of network of thinkers. So you've got unofficially in it, you've got um, Eric Weinstein, Brett Weinstein, Joe Rogan, Dave Rubin, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Douglas Murray, Majid Nawaz, and a few more names. I mean, there was, there was a few that were in the New York Times article that kind of officially, I guess, inaugurated it as a concept. Um, I think we have a slightly different take on what it is and where it's going. I think a lot of people are looking at it at the moment through a sort of political lens, and it's a good first step because I think what it does is these are all people who've got a real um, kind of attachment to free speech and an attachment to having com difficult conversations about topics that are increasingly difficult to have in the mainstream media. And what I think it's done initially, like the whole phenomenon of the intellectual dark has showed up, shown up how ideological the media has become, like some things you can say, some things you can't say. But I think there's a kind of mistake to see it just through this political lens, which is what I think a lot of the people and descriptions of it have been so far. Yeah, and it's, it's ironic in a way because a big one of the tenets of it is to move beyond ideology and to be able to have these discussions which are you know, free from that. For me, the really interesting thing is what happens or what's the direction we start moving in when we begin to have these conversations beyond ideology? This is where I think I and we have a different understanding about it because I see it potentially moving towards a synthesis, moving towards a, an intellectual synthesis. And someone like Jordan Peterson is a really good starting point for this because he already synthesizes so many different ways of looking at the world. He integrates evolutionary biology, he integrates psychology, he integrates mythology and religion and ends up in a very similar place with all of them. He then kind of also brings in neuroscience and says, yeah, well, chaos and order, even the brain is divided between chaos and order. Look at Ian McGrillchrist's work, the master and the emissary, the left brain, the right brain. There's, there's, a, there's a real integration happening already with someone like Jordan Peterson. There was a really amazing podcast with, on, the Dave, on the Dave Rubin show with Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson. And then I've seen another couple where Jordan Peterson was on Ben Shapiro's podcast. And what you see is it's almost like Jordan Peterson kind of absorbed Ben Shapiro in a way because Ben Shapiro's argument is sort of from, from revelation. It's like, okay, we have these moral truths that are kind of given to us. And Peterson was saying, well, these moral truths also evolve. Like you can look at kind of how, how morality evolves, but there is in some sense like a revelation from above and a morality that evolves and the two come together and that there's some sort of sense of, like Peterson's conception of religion and evolution and morality kind of encompass um, Ben Shapiro's perspective. And he's able to say, well, yeah, I'm not saying you're wrong, Ben, but I also think you can get there from many different methods. Mm -hmm. And that's a, it was a really like amazing thing to see. Like you could just see the synthesis in action. I mean, it's, it's slightly kind of, Maybe unfair to Ben Shapiro to say that Jordan Peterson absorbed him, but Jordan Peterson had the biggest frame. Mm. And Ben Shapiro had a very deep frame, and he's a very deep thinker, but his frame was then encompassed within Jordan Peterson's. And you could see the, the intellectual excitement of both of them to have that conversation. Of Ben Shapiro in particular, the respect that he had for Jordan Peterson and where he was coming from, like really reframed and added another level of depth potentially to what, what Ben Shapiro was already saying. And you do see a lot of the guys in the intellectual dark web, they have these conversations and then when you watch them on another podcast, they're saying something that sounds an awful lot like someone they heard before. Like a lot of people are sounding a lot more like Jordan Peterson after they've spent a lot of time with him. Um, so there, this is what I feel this synthesis is, is about. But again, it can only happen if people are prepared to, to allow what is untrue to burn off, to do what Peterson says again, it's like, are you willing to allow what is false to burn off and to go through the process of, 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 um, yeah, of growth, which is always painful? And I think there is a shared understanding between all of the, or between lots of the members of the intellectual dark web that there is something called reality that we can perceive that is independent of us as perceivers, which is, you know, that's, that for me has a lot of the 
energy and excitement of it is moving away from that postmodern mulch of, of radical, radical relativity. And that is a key thing if you want to burn away the deadwood. Because you have to, I mean, inherent in that is the idea that there is, there is something core beneath it. And that there is something that is true. So again, it, you know, it is a reclaiming of truth as well. Um, that I think a lot of them really share. Otherwise, why, why talk to get somewhere? You have to get towards something that is independent of all of us as perceivers. And for me, that's where a lot of the power of it comes from. And what's fascinating is that you just get a sense the people involved in this conversation recognize something is happening. It's almost like a conversation that's becoming self-aware. It's aware of itself and it's very excited. Like Dave Rubin's the classic example. He's kind of like, something's going on. The internet's forced us, forced us together and I don't believe in kind of synchronicity, but something's happening. And, and I, I think it's kind of a great awakening. You could, you could, and I wonder whether you could almost re-term it as a great intellectual awakening. Partly generated, again, it's, it's partly created by the internet. It's where we now have the possibility to have three hour conversations. We now have the possibility to kind of follow the rabbit hole as far down as it goes. We have the capability to now find ideas outside the acceptable kind of surface level mainstream of the mainstream media and then go down these rabbit holes and, and, and potentially be changed as a consequence. Yeah, that, I feel that energy with it when I watch it and just, you know, engage with it. There is that sense of that kind of electric sense of something happening. Uh, for me, it's about the beginnings of something happening. It is something happening, but it's the beginnings of something bigger. And I think that's where the excitement comes from. Like if you look at a lot of the key players, they have had to, they're talking about their ideas in a very different way, but they've all had to embody their ideas to some degree. Like Brett Weinstein had to do something and stand up, you know, and call it Jordan Peterson, of course, had to do a lot of things and was under a lot of pressure. I think that's a really interesting thing about it, is that these are people whose philosophy had to be embodied in some way, and I think that's the direction we're moving in. That's a really good idea, yeah, that's a really smart way of looking at it, because, yeah, it's like, th these people have had to live out their philosophies. And Brett and Eric Weinstein talk about it on the Dave Rubin podcast, which is an amazing podcast, watch it if you haven't seen it already. Um, the, what you've had is almost this selection process for people who are thinking outside the box. Because if you, if you insist that everyone uses a certain set of pronouns, either Jordan Peterson, or you insist that all white professors don't come into a college on a certain day, as they did with Brett Weinstein, what you find is the people who are prepared to say no are prepared to stand out against the herd. They are exactly the kind of people who you need, who are almost certain to have created something extraordinary in their work because they're, they're thinking differently. Um, and also I think you also sort of touch on the idea that this is the start of a conversation, that there is a, a deeper synthesis that potentially they're, they're moving towards. So there's, there's many levels to this conversation and the intellectual dark web is sort of the, it's almost like a holding concept for the ongoing conversation. And it, it, it is a conversation. You've got throughout this, this summer and this year and ongoing, you've got a lot of these guys in conversation with each other in very public venues. And effectively what, what we're seeing is kind of intellectual content becoming like, this happened to comedy in the 90s. Suddenly comedy came out of the small clubs and was now kind of selling out the O2 Arena and Wembley and all this sort of stuff. And this is now happening with intellectual content, which has to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but also, so there's, there's the sense of, okay, this conversation is happening, but if this conversation is not an open inquiry, then it's gonna fail, I think. And this is up to everyone in the intellectual dark web to make sure that this is the case. It's like, so that what is the meta conversation? How do you have a meta conversation that's genuinely generative, that's genuinely kind of potentially finding a resolution? And you have to be the people involved, like it takes a huge amount of intellectual courage for someone like Sam Harris to say, you know, maybe I was, a bit, I was wrong about this atheist thing. <laughs> he's made an entire career and wrote several books about this. So it, I think at some point he's at least going to have to reframe yeah. kind of what he means and, and accept that some kind of metaphorical truth is also valuable as well as scientific truth. Mm. Um, so this sense of like open inquiry is, is really important. It's like, am I open to new information or do I just keep trying to kind of filter everything into what I already think? Well, you're not really an intellectual unless you are willing to release your previously held notions when new information comes 
to light. That's what it, that's what it really should be, I think. Um, and just, just on, the, on the rock stadium kind of feel of it, uh, you know, I was just thinking, you know, I think it's interesting to look at the energy that drives that many people to want to go, instead of seeing a concert, see an intellectual talk. Um, and what strikes me about the whole thing and about what they're doing, on one level, is it's an inquiry into reality. Because increasingly, in a kind of post-truth world, we don't have a sense of what reality is. Um, you know, practically, politically, metaphysically, and I think there's a deep hunger for that. And that's what, again why that inquiry has to remain open, because reality is bigger than the person perceiving it, contrary to the postmodern worldview, which would say, no, it's, it's all these perceptions. As the conversations continue, I hope that what we will start to see is a real, is a growing synthesis between these different perspectives in the intellectual dark web. And these are really deep perspectives. This is why it's another mistake to look at it through the political lens, is that these, these guys go right to the bedrock. Like Peterson goes right to the bedrock. Uh, Brett Weinstein goes right to the bedrock in terms of evolutionary biology. Eric Weinstein is a superstar mathematician who I think probably has a, a very different take on it because he's seeing sort of, he's seeing almost like the source code. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why he originated the, the, the whole concept of the intellectual dark web, because he's seeing quite a long way down the track. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's a few things that then are holding up that synthesis. For example, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. There's a huge, that's, that's a really interesting conversation, because if, if they're both willing to do the work and to give up, like Sam Harris is in a very difficult position because I think ultimately he is going to have to concede that there are mythological truths in religion. Um, as Brett Weinstein says, they are mythologically true, or what did he say? They're metaphorically true, but literally, literally false. Mm -hmm. Sam Harris has been very resistant to that perspective, but I, I think going as this conversation continues, he's gonna find it increasingly difficult to defend that position. So just to reverse back a bit to what you were saying a second ago, for me, one of the really interesting questions is, is it a synthesis? Like it is, I think, a synthesis, but also the way paradigm shifts, the way, you know, Kuhn pointed out, paradigm shifts happen, or when the existing paradigm, there's so much that doesn't fit into it that the pressure builds and eventually a new one forms. So I'm just wondering where the, you know, you just talked about Peterson and Harris, in a sense, some worldview has to give in, in some way. You know, the materialist paradigm potentially has to give to something beyond that, something that integrates that, but moves beyond it um, and recognizes, for example, religion and the transcendent. So for me, I think that's where it could go, is that the synthesis also leads to something shifting fundamentally in the way we communicate and the way we, you know, an idea is revolution as they talk about. You know, for me, that requires some synthesis first, but then some kind of, um, radical reevaluation as well. How do we, how the hell do we find a way through that chaos and how do we see reality more clearly? And I think that is an overwhelming urge for millions of people right now. How do we see reality more clearly? And yeah, to your point, it has to be done in a flexible, open way because reality is constantly shifting. And I think Peterson in particular understands that. Mm -hmm. like he talks about the humility of understanding that you don't know enough yeah. by definition. That in a way, God is, fear of God, he talked about in the interview that I did with him, like what's, what's the real key to, to true knowledge? And I suggested that kind of intellectual courage was a big part of that and kind of embodied knowledge was a big part of that. And he said that fear of God was the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that was you always have to remember as if your life depends on it, because it does, that you don't know enough. And so there's the, it, it requires that kind of level of humility. So to summarize, we think that the intellectual dark web is a kind of placeholder for an ongoing conversation that hopefully will approach some kind of synthesis, like intellectual synthesis, able to jump between evolutionary biology and psychology and all these different things, but ultimately saying, well, we're looking at the same thing. This is how the world is, but we can look at it these different ways. Mathematics. Um, and they're ironing out, at the moment, hopefully they're ironing out all of the sort of disagreements between them, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, all that sort of stuff. 
with the hope that they can reach this kind of synthesis. Where does it go if that's true? What is what what comes next? I think ultimately the intellectual synthesis is only one part. And what needs to happen is a kind of there's an embodied synthesis that needs to come come in as well. And there's a there's a danger of it just becoming an intellectual thing, whereas actually we know things at our core. Like we don't know things from here. We know things in our gut, we know things in our emotions. And there's an embodied there's there's an embodied nature to true knowing. So I'm looking at people like who are who are now not considered it part of the intellectual diet web, but I think are holding really key parts of the puzzle. Um, Richard Tarnas, I mentioned before, I think kind of named it all really, really clearly back in the 70s, I think. Um, no, a bit later, I think it was actually in the 90s. Um, you've got people like Stan Groff, who've been working with psychedelic therapy and transformational work since the, since the 50s. Jamie Wheel, who we interviewed, and we're about to bring out another interview with soon. He, he's a, he works with flow states and he works with transformational states. That, I think, is, is, is where we have to go. There are things we cannot understand with just our minds. And coming into the body and also living and you know, acting out and putting these things into our lives, which you know, Peterson talks about a lot, that is really, for me, the next stage. And philosophy used to be like that. Before, before Plato in particular, where it became about kind of a discussion of ideas and the kind of let's, let's have a dialectic and let's you know, discuss these ideas, which is important, but it's not enough. It's not enough. They have to be lived, but something else happens when you do that. Something very different happens and it changes how we are in the world and it also frees us from ideology in a, in a very new way. Because ideology is a thing of, of the ego and the mind. So if you stay up there, you can't undo ideology with the mind, really. It it's, comes from a much deeper level, and that's why it's exciting to explore all these different thinkers who are really at the cutting edge of those practices and the cutting edge of the science behind it as well. And also why we are increasingly doing workshops. Yeah. Rebel Wisdom has always had the intellectual content and the films, but also the workshops. And we're expanding that. We're, we've got some amazing facilitators coming in, Louise Mazzanti, uh, from the Glitch in the Matrix film, and we've done a couple of um, interesting interviews with her. Uh, Mike Lusada, uh, Raffia, Turia. We've got some amazing people who are kind of going to come and lead stuff for us. Um, so that's really, really exciting. So we're introducing a new section, or stealing it from Sam Harris. Um, he calls it housekeeping, which is kind of like logistics and kind of what's coming up and all the rest of it. Uh, and what's coming up is the first Rebel Wisdom road trip in America. We're flying out to LA on Sunday, the first, and we're out there for about two weeks. So if you're watching this and you're out there, LA, San Fran, Bay Area, or you can suggest people that we should be interviewing there. We've already got some amazing people lined up. We're going to see Jordan Greenhall, Akira the Don, um, Richard Tarnas, Warren Farrell, so we've got a really amazing list of interviewee interviewees already. If you can think of anyone that we should be talking to, um, then give us a shout. Or if you are a dev Rebel Wisdom devotee, uh, let us know. We'll also have some merch with us that we might be giving out t-shirts to people. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, get in touch if you're in the Bay Area or in on the West Coast.